so welcome here today, but both the people in the room and online. It's pretty hard on a Saturday on a lovely day outside to come here, but um, you can see my disclosures there. So I'm going to talk about the fact of, you know, there's a number of people that can do vaccinations, immunisations in this country, and we're all working towards the same aim. And I think that that's what we've got to remember. This used to be considered to be the realm of general practice, and I have been on discussions where it should be just the GPs who do this. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did in the pandemic if it had only been GPs. So I think it's really important that we value all those people as part of the team. We're not in competition. We're all there to help one another. Probably giving you the summary already and we can move to the next one. But we'll just talk through a bit of it. So um, to give vaccinations, immunisations in this country, you have to be an authorised immuniser or be working under the supervision of such a person. Um, the legislation does vary from state to state. So, um, you know, I'm not over all the state legislation, so really important to work with your public health units. And just because I'm from Tasmania, I made sure I found a map with Tasmania on it because we often get forgotten. Okay, so the people that make up this group and are bound to have forgotten something, but of course, general practitioners who have been doing this role. Ironically, I think probably while general practitioners are named as the people who give a lot of the immunizations, it's in fact they're practice nurses. Without my practice nurse, I'm not sure where I'd be. They are my most valuable asset because they're the ones that are actually probably putting their needles in the arm, calming the parents, um, reassuring people, talking to people about what's actually happening and um, keeping up to date with looking after our fridges, ordering our vaccines. Um, so, as I said, while the vaccine might go down on air as being given by the GP, it's probably the practice nurse that did all the, all the work. Um, we also have nurse immunisers who can work independently and they're really important and some practices are lucky enough to have a nurse immuniser as their practice nurse, but they can also go and do outreach programs. Um, pharmacists are relatively new to this and they're providing a great resource and they've been really good in getting things, the COVID-19 vaccines and the influenza vaccines up to date. And, you know, that's an opportunistic thing. So many people are time poor as we keep hearing, and they're, but they're popping into the pharmacy for whatever, to pick up a script, to um, do a bit of shopping for their cosmetics and having the opportunity to be able to have a vaccine while they're there. They're often open longer hours, so that sort of helps with things. And um, one of my nurse practitioners, who's a nurse immuniser, was giving some vaccines for a pharmacy a few years ago before it could have, they had done their training. And she saw people that attended our practice and she said, you know, you can... I know and do know that you're eligible for a funded influenza vaccine. And they said, it's more convenient to come here, even if it does cost me $25. I get it done while I'm here and I haven't got time to go and see, see the doctors. Um, Aboriginal health workers who enable our you know, individuals who are more remote to be able to vaccinate, be vaccinated. Um, to be an authorised immuniser, you need to have completed recognised training for your profession. And in fact, some vaccines have additional training. As we all know, as we work through the COVID, the special website for the COVID vaccine and training and got our little certificates. And I believe it's actually all closing up soon. So I presume they I think we all know all about it now. Um, if you wish to give yellow fever vaccines, you have to do training and obtain a certificate. And likewise, Q fever has a required course to complete. You need an up-to-date resuscitation certificate because hopefully it never happens, but there is a risk of anaphylaxis with a vaccine, so you need to be prepared and ready to go. And if you give childhood vaccinations, you need to have that to cover babies. You need to keep your vaccine safe in that lovely cold fridge, that's drive for five, which all immunizers would know from cover to cover. You need a suitable private area. You can't line people up and leave... Some of you who remember the incidents of um, fainting with the HPV vaccine, and it did turn out that the girls were being lined up to have their vaccine in the library, and there was a mezzanine floor where they could actually see the girls have been vaccinated. And so by the time they got there, they were all a quivering mess. So it's probably not surprising there was episodes of fainting. Um, and there's both the NIP vaccines and the private vaccines, which we'll talk a bit more in my other talk, but um, some places 
you can only give NIP vaccines. Some places it's only private vaccines. The whole thing that holds this together and is the Australian Immunisation Register, really. It's the national record of what you've been vaccinated. And when I first started in general practice, you had no idea what people had been vaccinated for. You had, you, If you were lucky, they brought along the little baby book, which was a little cardboard book, nothing as swish as it is now. And they might have remembered to bring it. They probably didn't. Um, and you were just flying by the seat of your pants as to what people were vaccinated. Um, I already decided that children needed to be microchipped with a Medicare number and their vaccination status because... People go, oh, I don't know. Oh, perhaps I did. Maybe I didn't. Um, so along came um, the Children's Register, and I was absolutely delighted. It wasn't easy always to record things on them because we had little purple slips. I don't know if there's any old enough to remember the little purple slips, and we'd find them left in patients' file, all sorts of things. But, you know, and you could ring up and you could find out what they were, and people get these lovely printouts with teddy bears on them. Um, and we had many, many meetings after that about whole of life register and it was all too hard and it was all this and I sat in a whole day in Sydney and came away so disappointed but that's when I realised that the issue was it wasn't just general practice that was immunising, there were so many other places and how could all these people get it onto the air. But, you know, the COVID vaccine situation brought that up. We needed to know who'd had a COVID vaccine we needed that we had that. If you remember, we, you couldn't have your COVID within two weeks of your flu, etc. So you needed to know when they had their flu. It has to record all the immunisations given under the NIP, but you can record seasonal ones, um, travel, that sort of thing. And in fact, I used it on Wednesday. I used the childhood register to find out a family were. Mum happened to mention she was off to feed. Fiji, and she thinks she had some vaccines when they went on holidays when the girls were little, and we actually went into one of the daughters' um, vaccination register to find out when they had their vaccines, and as they all lined up together, we had some dating of when they had the vaccines. So, you know, you can even use it retrospectively for that, um, and it should all be recorded, and I do get very frustrated when I have instances where I someone tells me they've had a vaccine, I uh, look on air, which in my practice software is just to click into their um, immunisation, their, their immunisations I've given in the practice in best practice. I click on that and it tells me what's already on air. It also uploads when I give anything to air, so it's pretty quick and easy for general practice to record these vaccines. It's not always as easy for some of the other providers. Um, but, yeah, to find that people haven't got their flu vaccine recorded and, you know, people go to the emergency department with their tetanus-prone injury, and I'd love to see that the emergency departments looked on air to see if it was there, um, or they can do that through my health record, or they um, recorded what they gave, but that's still a work in progress. Um, just to show you an immunisation history statement, I actually had to print out my son's because his grandmother has gone into an aged care facility and he's required to show that. And that's the sort of thing that's a, a probably a fairly brief history of his vaccination because he was um, born before the, the baby shots went on. Um, he will tell you if he was in the room that he's been vaccinated for everything known to mankind. Um, but, you know, that's got sort of his COVID. And our patients are very familiar with this now because they are going to look up their immunisation record on their MyGov to show it to get in to visit relatives or to travel or whatever it might have been. And so they start coming in and saying, oh, I've got this and it says that I'm actually due for um, a pneumococcal vaccine. I'm new for something. So they're now talking about their immunisations, which is great. They also come in and say, oh, what about that yellow fever I had, you know, 15 years ago? Well, air wasn't around. And so I give my little spiel about how glad I, I am to have air with us now. Um, and for those who think that perhaps general our other organisations are taking over our job and that in fact, um, you know, general practice is missing out on vaccination, I just, it's hard to actually find numbers, but because the influenza vaccinations are generally going on the air, we can actually see where they were given. And you can see for this year alone, up until September, over 5 million vaccines were given by GPs, probably 4.5 million by practice nurses. Um, the pharmacy gave to, 
just a bit over 2 million, and the group called Other gave 1.3 million. Now, it's possible Other is higher because I'm not sure how well the workplace vaccinations get recorded on air, and that's where I sometimes see the discrepancies. Um, I know it's not easy because we um, do some nurse, uh, some workplace vaccinations and the um, I have to bring them back, give the forms to my practice nurse who has to load them up onto air in a different manner to what we load our patients up. 